It is, uh, it's now 12.50 on the East Coast here, so we'll get started. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ryan, our IT specialist, is going to be helping out, just letting in those people who might be in the waiting room. Um, but I thought we could, we could get started um, <clears throat> uh, with, with a few words to introduce Rose Gutmuller. Um, Rose Gutmuller is the, the Frank E. and Arthur W. Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. Before joining Stanford, Gottmuller was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016 until 2019. Prior to NATO, she served nearly five years as Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the US Department of State, advising the Secretary of State on arms control, nonproliferation, and political military affairs. While Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance in 2009 and 2010, she was the Chief U.S. Negotiator of the New Strategic Arms Reduction Tree, New START, with the Russian Federation. The first of two lectures this week, Rose Gutmuller will speak today on negotiating with the Russians, a personal perspective. Please join me in welcoming Rose Gottmuller. Thank you very much, Darlith, and it's uh, great to be with you today. I see uh, that you are spread across the world, and I thank you for tuning in uh, from as far away as Kazakhstan and perhaps Armenia. I'm uh, really pleased and honored. I'm here in California, and uh, so I think we truly are a, a global community on this uh, on this. Uh, lecture this morning, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. You know, this lecture comes at a really good time. I'm just completing the first draft of my book on the New START Treaty negotiations, and I am beginning to think about the lessons learned. So you can help me. I will be interested to hear if both our American and Russian participants and participants from elsewhere react the same to my list of questions. Maybe you will think that some are not important at all, or at least shouldn't be priority lessons. Maybe you can tell me what you think should be the most important things in a negotiation from the perspective of your experience and your culture. So I truly will look forward to our discussion at the end of my, uh, of my lecture. So to launch in, my top lesson is one that I learned long ago, but it is still worth repeating. You should never pursue an arms control treaty negotiation for its own sake, but because it is in your national security interest, which you can clearly, clearly identify, your objectives in the negotiation need to serve that interest. Of course, the interests of parties sometimes clash, and that is where the need for flexibility and compromise come in. And I must stress that flexibility and compromise are always important to get to yes in a negotiation. Zero sum games simply don't produce success. It helps if the national security interest is articulated at the highest level by your president or prime minister, and if he or she gives clear marching orders based on that interest. We were lucky in New York in the New START treaty negotiations because President Obama and then President Medvedev met early in London in April of 2009 and issued a joint statement to launch the negotiations. They then met again in July of 2009 in Moscow to issue a joint negotiating framework that laid out all the basic building blocks of the treaty and really gave us our marching orders to get into the detailed treaty negotiations. But that London statement early on clearly stated that the new treaty would replace the original START treaty, which was going out of force in December of 2009. That joint statement from London also clearly stated that the new agreement would be about reducing strategic offensive arms. This helped with later arguments from our Russian counterparts who kept insisting that we should look at constraining missile defenses in this treaty negotiation. But I kept reminding them what the presidents had said from their earliest meeting, that we needed to focus on constraining strategic offensive arms. The missile defense issue would be dealt with in a separate negotiation and indeed 
there was a series of discussions about missile defense issues between the US and Russia at that time. Having a solid interagency delegation with representatives not only from the Foreign Affairs Ministry, or in our case, the State Department, but also the Defense and Security Ministries is absolutely paramount. If you're only negotiating with the diplomats, then you won't know if the military supports the idea of a new treaty. You may very well be wasting your time. We were nervous at the outset of the negotiations that the Russian military and intelligence services would not show up to serve on the Russian delegation. And then we were very relieved when not only a full team of experts showed up from those ministries, some of whom had worked in previous negotiations like the START negotiations 20 years earlier, but they also uh, included some generals, that is very senior military and intelligence agency uh, leaders that showed broad support for the negotiations in the Russian government. That said, high level representatives, while necessary, cannot do all the work. You have to be willing to empower the experts to solve problems at the negotiating table. And in fact, we did have a series of negotiating tables in the New START Treaty. We broke out into working groups to look at the inspection regime, to look at how to structure the database, to consider how the notification regime would work. So all these very detailed matters were handled separately in different working groups and not simply in plenary session. It's the only way you can succeed. Otherwise, the negotiations will simply take forever. In the case of New START, we didn't have much time. We started our formal negotiations at the end of April 2009, after the presidents had met at the beginning of April 2009, and we were supposed to be finished by December of 2009. This was an unprecedented pace, given the history. The START Treaty, which was negotiated in the late 1980s and early 1990s, took six years on and off to negotiate. It took some convincing, but I finally got my Russian counterpart to agree to empower his experts to negotiate. Luckily, both teams, the US and the Russian team, had excellent working level people, weapon system operators and inspectors who had worked on START and INF inspections. They knew better than I did what was needed in the verification protocol for the treaty or the database or what notifications were needed to ensure that we were informing each other on a regular basis of, uh, of important developments in our strategic nuclear forces. So I just needed to empower those on the US side. And luckily, as I said, my counterpart agreed to do the same on the Russian side. So the basic lesson here is you cannot just depend on plenary meetings. They are very formal, they're very important, they record moments of great progress or moments of great disagreement. But you really need to have working groups working separately, hammering out the technical details, and you have to empower those experts on those groups to work through important issues and to come to some solutions. Otherwise, you will never get where you need to go. Next lesson. Don't think that you're going to negotiate the same treaty over again. For one thing, objectives and requirements change and problems that cropped up in the implementation of the previous treaty need to be fixed. That was certainly the case with the START treaty. We had used counting rules in START by which the missiles were counted to carry the maximum number of warheads with which they had been, been tested. In the case of the US submarine launched missiles, the Trident missiles, they had been tested with eight warheads. So each Trident missile was always counted with eight warheads. However, the Navy decided to take warheads off the Tridents, as we say, to download those missiles, so that sometimes they carried no more than four warheads. For that reason, by the time we came to negotiate the New START Treaty, the Trident submarine launched missiles had been seriously overcounted in the START Treaty for some period of time. We needed to fix that problem to get an accurate count of how many US warheads were actually deployed, which we did by focusing in the new treaty on actually confirming the number of warheads 
on the front end of missiles through an inspection process that we called re-entry vehicle on-site inspection. And it involved radiation detection, detecting whether certain objects on the front of the missile were nuclear or actually identifying them as non-nuclear. I should be precise here because each side declared the number of warheads on the front end of the missile, but sometimes there are other objects on the front end of a missile. For example, both sides use decoys for missile defense purposes. And so in order to identify which are those non-nuclear objects on the front end of a missile, we used radiation detectors to ensure that they were not nuclear in nature. This was an important change from the START Treaty, and I want to stress was an important innovation that is going to help us in the future with arms control treaties that are more focused on constraining warheads rather than delivery vehicles. We can come back to that in our discussion period if you like. It's an important technical detail, but I do believe that going forward, we will now focus increasingly on constraining warheads in addition to delivery vehicles and their launchers. So the delivery vehicles are um, the missiles and the launchers are, for example, the transporter erector launchers that uh, the Russians use to deploy their, um, their mobile missile systems. So again, um, it's important to be ready to innovate and not just stick with the way things were done in the previous treaty. And to me, that is a very important lesson. You have to be ready to innovate in the negotiations and not just repeat past problems. Next lesson, and this was important and also hilarious to deal with. Don't think that the negotiations are going to be the same. When I worked on the START negotiations in 1991, uh, 1990 and 1991, we had Xerox machines, but no email. We had secretaries and typists, but no email. My job as a young State Department staffer was to stuff the delegation cubby holes or mailboxes with the latest versions of treaty language as it came in to us from the typists and was Xeroxed. By the time the new START treaty uh, talks came along, we obviously had electronic means of communication and record keeping and we used them to the hilt. If you needed the latest version of the treaty language, you looked it up on your computer. You didn't look in your cubby hole to see what the latest language was. In fact, we didn't even have cubby holes during the New START treaty negotiations. We could also communicate much more quickly with Washington using both secure and unclassified email. I am convinced access to email for our delegation really sped up the negotiations because we could ask for guidance from Washington and receive it back overnight very, very quickly. And that was important to be able to move as quickly as we did in the New START treaty negotiations. I actually believe that this is a case where we might have had some advantage over the Russian delegation, which did not use email for official delegation business. And that's an important point. I don't know what the official policy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow is today, but 10 years ago when we negotiated New START, they were still very, very dependent on cable communication with Moscow. Another thing that really sped things up in the negotiations was the mobile phone. Early on, I traded mobile phone numbers with my counterpart and I urged my executive secretary to do the same with her counterpart. When I needed to arrange a meeting or phone call with my counterpart, I would simply send him a text message. This was a big difference from the start negotiations in 1990, when invitations for meetings or calls would have to be laboriously exchanged via fax machines. If some urgent issue arose overnight, forget about it. There was no way to get through to the Soviet mission at that time until the central switchboard opened up again in the morning. So mobile communications were of great benefit to the talks. It's hilarious to, re uh, to reflect on this because I actually had some on my delegation who had worked on START and they believed that we needed to continue with this past practice to just use fax machines and exchange messages back and forth. And it took some convincing by me 
the chief negotiator to say, no, we can't stick with that old traditional way of doing things. We'll never get this treaty finished. And they were a little bit angry with me, to be honest, because they thought it was the only right way to go. But I am convinced that the advent of mobile communications was very important to the speed uh, of our talks. And not only the fact that I could communicate with my counterpart, but as I noticed, noted, the executive secretaries could talk together. And there were several occasions when we had uh, very, uh, well, emergency meetings to arrange, particularly when uh, our two presidents, President uh, Obama and President Medvedev, agreed to get together in Copenhagen in December of 2009 at the Copenhagen uh, Environmental Con Conference that was going on at that time. A global conference, they weren't scheduled to meet on New Start, but they agreed at the last minute to a meeting. And if we hadn't been able to exchange phone calls in the middle of the night between our executive secretaries to arrange the details of that, I'm not sure that the presidents would have had a successful meeting. So that's why I'm saying very important in these kinds of negotiations to have 24 seven communications means, not that you use them every day, but for emergencies and for really quick action, when it's needed, you have that kind of communication capability. But let's think for a moment about today, I've been saying that we needn't repeat uh, or only stick with the way things are done today, but uh, the next negotiation, I think given all the experience we're having now with re remote televideo conferencing, uh, we may be doing more negotiation remotely. I will say, however, that person-to-person -person contacts are vital, uh, which is why I am glad that Marshall Billingsley and Sergey Ripkov are meeting in person in Vienna today with interagency teams. I wish them well in their talks. Indeed, the personal touch is vital to success in my view. Every negotiator makes use of occasional lunches or coffees to take private stock with his or her counterpart. And we did so pretty frequently. It's an opportunity to speak frankly, and yes, sometimes to sketch out new ideas on the restaurant napkins. Particularly clear, I remember from the start negotiations that the chief negotiators were always drawing pictures on napkins and then taking them back to their delegations to turn into official treaty proposals. Outdoor activities are also good. You're pretty sure you won't be listened to. Walks in the woods were made famous during the INF treaty negotiations in the 1980s. And my counterpart and I had a few walks outdoors. Although it being a muddy spring in Geneva, we spent more time walking around the neighborhoods behind the Russian mission than we spent walking in the woods. I think it also makes sense to reach out to others on the delegation, to develop a good sense of cooperation, and sometimes to make a little mischief. I, for example, decided that the women on the Russian delegation needed special encouragement and support. It was pretty much a man's world, the Russian delegation, unlike our delegation, which had a large number of both men and women experts. So I decided I needed to make a little mischief um, and so I would send little gifts to the women on the Russian delegation from time to time, such as at Christmas time, I sent them uh, ornaments from the White House. They're special ornaments that the White House makes available for, uh, for charity. Uh, they sell them for charitable purposes. I heard about that from the Russian men on the delegation. Where are our ornaments? They asked me. And I thought it was just a nice little sense, uh, perhaps, that the women on the delegation were something special too. And the personal touch is also vital to running your own delegation. It's your job to ensure that an esprit de corps develops and is maintained throughout the negotiating pressure cooker. When people are sometimes working seven days a week and 14 hours a day, as we were during the end game of the New START Treaty negotiations. They need to have a constant sense that they are all on the same team, even if naturally they are getting angry and shouting at each other from time to time. I did my best making sure that we celebrated Thanksgiving and Easter together, 
inviting the different teens over to my apartment for dinner, sometimes going to their dinners. I really enjoyed one Sunday evening when I went to have chili with the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff team. All of them were former bomber or missile guys, and they used to get together on Sunday, cook meals, and try to catch some of the US football games that were on that day in the United States, despite the six hour time difference. This time, however, when I went for a chili dinner, they were watching Dr. Strangelove, the bizarre comedy about nuclear war from the early 1960s. I have seen Dr. Strangelove many times, but never like this. The bomber and missile guys knew the dialogue by heart and could deliver the lines along with the actors on the screen. They also knew when those actors were cracking up with laughter during the ad-lib scenes. I had never noticed before. It was a great evening, and I think they appreciated it that I showed up. I was certainly the only woman in the room. Indeed, I was the first woman to be a chief negotiator of a strategic arms treaty. And I often get asked what was different about my style. What did I do differently from the men? I have thought about it a bit, and I think I could sum it up this way. My ego wasn't so invested in every minute at the negotiating table. Sometimes my counterpart played some outrageous games. In fact, he told me early on, to be fair, he told me early on that he loves to play games, but I didn't let it get under my skin. I got mad a couple times at the negotiating table, but I never got up and left. I think the fact that I used anger sparely and had a lot of patience helped us to move along more quickly than might have been the case in other times. But that's a judgment that others will have to confirm. By the way, I take note that the US delegation in Vienna today staged a photograph with Chinese, Russian, and US flags at the table evidently before the Russian delegation arrived and then published it. My only comment, the Russian side is not the only one who plays games from time to time at the negotiating table. It is difficult to develop mutual confidence in this way, which is key to a successful negotiation. However, again with enough patience, you can overcome even the most outrageous games. I will end by saying that the core lesson I learned again and again throughout the negotiations was that it is important to keep lines of communication open with political masters back in your capital. Sometimes this was a lesson that I learned rather painfully. Negotiations develop their own rhythm and often move more quickly than Washington or Moscow can comprehend. However, if something lands on your president's desk that he or she is not prepared for, you are going to hear about it. So my last lesson is, make sure you are communicating. And that means not only that your messages are getting sent, but they are also getting read and at the right levels. This can sometimes be very demanding if you don't know how the players are interacting back home, especially at the highest levels. However, it is your business to find out and ensure that they understand what the status is of the negotiations. Now, you know, I've been talking about bilateral negotiations between the United States and the Russian Federation. Multilateral negotiations are another order of magnitude in terms of their complexity because you are dealing with multiple interests and multiple actors all at once, as well as multi multiple cultures. In some ways, we have had it easy. We and the Russian Federation, earlier the USSR, in these bilateral negotiations over the years, we've developed a very good history at the negotiating table, and we know uh, many precedents upon which we can rely in order to make progress. That gives us the confidence to innovate as we did in the New START Treaty. But as we go forward, and I mentioned a moment ago, the United States is key to have China come to the negotiating table. As we go forward, I think it will be necessary to have more participants, perhaps beginning with the P5, uh, the nuclear weapon states under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So US, UK, France, China, and Russia 
come together to begin to develop some mutual measures of confidence and perhaps a future in the future to negotiate. But it will take time and it will take patience and it will be more complex, much more complex than what we have experienced over the past 50 years of our joint negotiating experience. With that, I will end and I very much look forward to your discussion, uh, to our discussion and to your questions and comments.